The big yellow barn on Route 313 West, just the other side of the Battenkill, is hard to miss. It's mainly used for storing equipment for the town of Arlington, but right behind it is a community garden where vegetables have been and are being grown, some of which winds up at the Arlington Food Pantry and for the summer lunch program at local schools. That's where we met up with Heather Hamilton the chair of the Bennington County chapter of the University of Vermont Master Gardener Extension Program. Summer's here, and the time is right for planting your vegetables. We asked Heather to walk us through the steps of how to plant a successful garden, and here it is. Well, Heather, just, just to kind of get us started here, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about the Yellow Barn in, in general before we get uh, going on to the planting sure. vegetables? Uh, what, what, what's, uh, what's the purpose of the Yellow Barn? Well, so the Yellow Barn, actually the property belongs to the town of Arlington, and it's also part of the uh, Vermont Land Trust. So it's, it's basically conserved property that can be used for agricultural purposes. So there have been efforts in the past to start a community garden here, and unfortunately there, people just didn't stay with it. But as we all know, COVID got everybody excited about gardening. And as a part of that, um, a group of us who are a UVM Extension Master Gardeners decided to start a victory garden here as part of a UVM initiative around the state. And it was really to grow vegetables to give to the local communities as needed. So in 2020, um, we started this initial garden to my right, which is the victory garden. And the, all the produce that we grow here, we donate to the local food bank, the summer lunch program. And we also have a food stand over at the East Arlington Federated Church, where as we all know, um, vegetables don't decide you don't decide when a vegetable wants to be picked. So the food um, market and the school lunch program are a specific day of the week. So it's really nice to have another place where we can donate food. So that's been going on since 2020 and it's all volunteer run. Um, everybody who gives their time, we you know grow the vegetables, we take care of them, we harvest them, etc. Um, in the last two years, we also added a cooperative garden, which basically is a group of seven families and uh, we are, looking at all times for potentially a few more families who grow their own food here. They work as a cooperative, which means you don't have a plot that's yours. Everybody works together. So they grow the tomatoes, they grow the broccoli, the lettuce, the spinach, summer squash, whatever, and they share the produce. And as you can see, it's a pretty good sized garden. So we often have extra and all of that also gets donated. So the goal is that we don't grow anything that gets wasted. So that's really what's going on now. And we've also, in the process of adding a pollinator garden, um, as I think many people know, pollinators are at great risk in the entire world. We've lost huge amounts, 30% of the bird population um, in the last 30 years or so, um, about a third of our insects pollinators since 2008. I mean, it's, it's very scary. And one of the things that we can all do to, to counter that is to put in gardens that have native plants that support our native insects and birds. And so we're in the process of building one of those also. Okay, well, uh, let's do the deep dive, as the it were. deep dive. Into uh, what are the do's and don'ts of planting a vegetable garden. Uh, looks like we have a couple of uh, instructions a, yeah, here. We have a few steps. I decided to uh, write them down so we wouldn't skip anything. Um, it's obviously June, so if you're gardening, you've probably decided where you're gonna garden, but there are a few things that you should make sure you've taken care of. The first thing is vegetables want sunlight. They need six to eight hours of sunlight. So if you have a garden in the shade, what you're gonna be able to grow is basically greens, like lettuce and spinach. You're not gonna be able to grow a lot of other things. So make sure you've got sun. The second thing is water. Um, our first year here, our water was about 200 yards away from here. It was a nightmare because we had to run hoses and then we had to pick them up. And it's, you can't put them on a timer. I mean, it, you just, you know, you have to like be here all the time watering. So you need to have easy access to water, whether that's, you know, a watering can and a spigot or a hose, whatever, you want it to be very close by. Um, and one of the reasons is that I brought this handy little gauge here vegetables need one inch of water a week so that's that much water and you might think recently with all these little scattered storms like oh it's fine we've had lots of water well if you went out and looked at your rain gauge you'd be lucky if we had a quarter of an inch because they're such scattered and such light rains that they're not amounting to anything so this is a nice thing to have in your garden just so you can double check and say yeah we got a lot of rain this week or wait we didn't get anything i thought we did um 
I'm sorry, that's really important that you manage that. The other thing is that in the beginning of the year, when you put in your baby plants, you can't give them a lot of water all at once or they'll drown. So you have to water them like every day probably. It's really hot. We have those really hot days in June. We had to water like twice a day here with our little plants because they just dried out. They don't have enough strength. So it's, you know, you need to, you don't want to have to be running around trying to find water because what'll happen is you won't water and they'll die. And we don't want that to happen. Um, what we do recommend though, as master gardeners, the best thing is if you can put in soaker hoses, um, that's really what you want to do. We have soaker hoses laid out in this garden. There's a, it's a black hose that runs through every single bed. And when you turn the water on, it literally just leaks water all along the garden, down every single bed. And what's wonderful about those, there are two things. A, you turn it on, say for an hour, whatever time you need. You can weed, you can do something else. You're not standing there with a hose trying to do it. But the more important thing is you're not getting water on the leaves. And one of the things that we all learn as vegetable gardeners is that vegetables, especially tomatoes, do not want water on their leaves. Because when you get water on the leaves, you make them susceptible to various fungus that are coming in on the wind. And if the leaves are wet, they'll stick. And if you've ever had tomatoes that just, you know, the leaves are getting yellow spots and brown spots and curling and falling, um, then you'll realize that something, obviously something's wrong. Well, it's very possible, it's very likely that is a fungus that has happened because the leaves were wet. And so we really recommend that you try not to get the leaves wet. And also that you put down like a straw, which is what we've done in this garden over here and this one underneath the tomatoes. So we're obviously outdoors, it's gonna rain, they're gonna get wet, but you don't want anything splashing up from the soil onto those leaves. So water. And then the last thing that obviously is really important is soil. <laughs> um, soil is usually not perfect in your garden. And so again, we highly recommend that you, especially with a new garden, you test your soil. And that may sound really complicated, it's not. What you do is you go around your garden, you dig a hole in about five places, you scoop up some of that soil, put it in a bucket, stir it up, take about a cup of it, put it in a plastic bag, and you mail it to the UVM. And I, I actually, I'm gonna show you what the form looks like, because it's, it's really not that complicated, even if it looks complicated. Basically, all you're doing is you're filling out your name and address, your email. If you do an email, you're gonna get the results faster than if you just give them your mailing address. And then you list out basically the size of your garden and what you're growing. And honestly, for a vegetable garden, you just put down general vegetables. The, the back of the form lists anything and everything you could ever wanna grow, but you're not growing one specific thing. And every soil test is $15. So we recommend that you just say, Use the code for general vegetables. You put the soil in the bag, the form. If you just go, you can just search online UVM soil test and that'll bring you straight to the form. And you print it off, you put it in, the, in an envelope with the soil, you mail it in and within like 10 to 12 days, they're gonna get back to you with a lot of information, but the most important thing will be the basic nutrients. And they'll tell you what to do if you need to amend your soil, they'll give you specific information um, and that can be really really helpful because you know a lot of us have very clay soils in vermont we don't necessarily have all the nutrients we need so we we really recommend especially when you're starting that you do a soil test all right so now we've got the location we've got we've got sun we've got water the soil's going to grow our plants so the next question is the size of your garden our recommendation in the first year you do a vegetable garden do not make it too big <laughs> It's a lot of work to take care of a vegetable garden, it just in the sense that you're gonna be watering it and weeding it and caring for it. And you don't wanna get overwhelmed because if you get overwhelmed the first year, then you'll run away. And it's, gardening is so wonderful and so enjoyable that you wanna enjoy it. So be very clear in your brain about how much time you have, you know, what size you can think you can manage. The second thing is what type of garden. Now in front of us, both of these gardens are there basically flat gardens they're they're not there's nothing in a box there's nothing in a pot they're, they're just in the ground that is the by far the easiest way to start a garden what we do recommend though as you can see we have rows in this garden that are soil and we have rows that are wood chips so what we've created basically are slightly raised rows so the rows that the plants are in are a little higher it helps them retain the water a little better it makes it easier for weeding um, and 
in between, we did what a form of um, weed control. We're putting down cardboard. You can also use newspaper, a nice thick layer, and then wood chips. And that keeps all the weeds out of your walkways. So you don't have to think about that part of your garden. So you think about it, you're taking like a third of your garden and you don't have to weed it anymore because you've got it totally covered. And you need those walkways to get to your plants. And part of the raised row also is it reminds you don't walk in that space. Because when you walk on a garden and you compact the soil, you make it much less vegetable growing friendly. It wants the soil to be loose. It doesn't want you stamping all over its roots. So the raised row is another way to say, okay, that's where the veggies go. I walk on the path, the veggies go in the raised row. You can also do a raised bed. And a raised bed is basically, you're building a box on the ground. Um, we have one and a garden over here, which is not really being planted right now. And you can make those as tall as you want. So there's one extremely good reason to do a raised bed, and that's if you don't have good soil and you can't amend it to be good. Like say, there was some kind of a plant there at some point that had chemicals or some there are heavy metals in your soil or something that you know that you're like I don't want to grow my food in that what you do with the raised row is you put down a heavy sheet of cardboard on the bottom you build your box and you fill it with safe clean soil compost mulch and you can you over time you're going to still test that but you're now totally controlling what's in that box and you know that the vegetables are growing in something that's safe so for that reason, it can be really important for some people to put in a raised bed. The other thing is, as you age, which many of us are doing, um, a raised row can be, a bed can be a lot easier. A raised bed can be, I mean, you can build it up like two feet and you can actually put a nice flat, you know, two by six on top of it. And you can actually sit on that while you're gardening. So it can be really, really a, a nice way to make gardening easier to do as we age. Um, the one caveat is don't make it any wider than four feet because you want to weed from each side. You can reach in about two feet. You know, you may not want it more than three feet wide, but you don't, again, you don't want to walk in it. <laughs> so you want to do all your weeding from the side. So make sure it can be as long as you want, but don't make it too wide. And I'd say the same thing about the raised rows in the garden. These are actually fairly narrow, but you could go up to three or four feet, but make sure that you can weed from both sides without walking into the soil. All right, the other option, of course, is if you live in an apartment or something, you can, you can grow in containers. You can take nice big pots or, you know, big window boxes. You can grow lettuce, they're patio style um, tomatoes and peppers, you know, things that are, have been bred to be grown in a smaller container. And that's a fantastic way to grow veggies if you don't have a lot of space. Or again, you just, you don't have the time um, or the physical ability to be running around in a big garden, it's really nice to, you can still grow vegetables. So, you know, don't think that you need an acre of land in order to grow vegetables, that is totally not necessary. And so we, we encourage you to grow them in, in whatever format you like. Um, so the next thing is, what are you gonna grow? Um, I would say the most important thing is you grow something you like to eat. <laughs> You know, I mean, you can go to the, you go to the, you know, your farmer's, your farmer's stand or your, your local, you know, grower, and there are all these gorgeous veggies and you're like, oh, I'm going to grow, let's do this, this and this. But if you don't like them, then don't do it. It doesn't make any sense. So think about what you got, you as a family um, or as a group like to eat and then select from that. The other thing I would say is don't grow too many varieties in the first summer. Um, and part of that is because every vegetable kind of has its own cycle. I mean, some of them really come into fruit and fruition like late July, early August, some are early, some are later. Some start and they die off and you can plant something else in there, but you don't, it's a, it can be a big management project if you've got, you know, 15 kinds of vegetables. So we recommend first year out, you know, do eight. I mean, just don't, don't make yourself too crazy. And as I said, do things you want to grow, not, I mean, you want to eat, not something you want to grow. So I've put a list together over here about actually the process of growing. We live in Vermont and we don't have a super long growing season. We have about three months from Memorial Day to mid of mid September. We sometimes get into the middle of October, but that's not guaranteed. So a lot of things we can start from seed, anything like a green leafy vegetable, you start from seed and it should be because they're very tiny and you don't want to repot them. Um, cucumbers, squashes, pumpkins, those start from seed very well. They start really fast. So do peas and beans. 
um, beets and radishes, carrots that are in the ground, you need to start in your garden. They can't start in a pot and be moved. Um, and then obviously things like dill and cilantro um, and nasturtiums, some of those things which there's another purpose for those in your garden, which I'll mention in a minute, those can all start from seed. If you're gonna grow the things that many of us wanna grow, basil, tomatoes, peppers, tomatillos, any of the brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, whatever, eggplants, buy plants or start them in your house maybe six to eight weeks before they need to go in the ground. And the reason for that is we can't start those in our garden in June. We will have this nice little green plant in September and it will be frozen and you still will not have any tomatoes or maybe you'll have a few. So those all need to be started first. And if you're gonna start your own, um, the Farmer's Almanac um, online has a fantastic planting chart. It tells you based on your zip code, um, if you're gonna start plants inside, you know, because they know when you can put it outside, it tells you when to start the plant inside. So if it needs six weeks to before it goes in the ground, they'll tell you, you know, it needs to start, you know, March 15th or whatever. But it's really, really helpful. And they'll also advise on whether or not they think it's something you should transplant. Because I said, some things are really hard to transplant. They're, they're small, they're sort of fragile. All the lettuces, I mean, they're, they're very light and they don't have a big root mass and you can tr transplant them, but it's, they're not that happy about it. So I, I recommend, I mean, there are other sites, but you know, everybody knows the Farmer's Almanac um, and it's a really, it's very helpful. And they also have a whole nice um, sort of a system for you can lay out your garden online if you want. Um, you can do it on a piece of paper too, but they have, a, they have a nice little software that you can use to do that same thing. So you're gonna decide what you wanna plant. The other thing is if you're doing onions or potatoes, those are tubers, they go in the ground. You, you get those again from a local farm store. Um, if you're doing garlic, that needs to go in in the fall. So just, that's a separate, it's a whole separate baby. You put it in in the fall, you put a nice, you know, straw on top of it. It sleeps through the winter and it's one of the first things that comes up. It's like crocuses, it comes up very early and you'll be harvesting it around July. So that's something to, you know, in, to plan on in advance. And if you want asparagus, fantastic, but that's a long process. So you need to plant them. You won't have asparagus for a couple of years. It, they, they have to mature, but it's all doable. Um, so then quickly, where to plant? And I say that only, that goes back to the sun issue. So what we recommend, even though uh, we're sort of moving this around a little bit this year, but your taller plants should be on the northern side of your garden your shorter plants on the southern and that's purely because of shade <laughs> if the if the tall plants are in the front they're going to cast a shadow on your shorter plants so you know just it's a very logical thing we don't necessarily think about it all the time but if you're growing corn or um, pole beans tomatoes anything that's going to go up you want those towards the back of your garden and um, you know when to plant I've already gone over that then you know use the farmers almanac um, guidelines to tell you when things can go outside I mean there's things we can plant fairly early like peas I mean, we plant that before the last frost but a lot of vegetables will not tolerate frost so you know look at that for anything you are thinking about starting early um, or you want to grow from seed and that'll be very helpful and so now we've got all these plants, we've decided what we're growing, we've sort of drawn out where they're gonna go in the garden. The next thing is make sure, and I brought a book because it's very helpful, and you can Google this online, but it's a really helpful book. It's called Plant Partners, and it came out about a year and a half ago. It's all science-based. So there've been lots of, you know, kind of, um, folklore about you know plant tomatoes and basil and or plant marigolds to you know keep bugs off of something um, and not that those were inaccurate but they'd never been actually scientifically researched uh, this book has researched all kinds of companion planting so what companions actually support each other in terms of maybe controlling pests but also what plants can't go together because they'll actually damage each other so for example, which I had forgotten the other day, um, onions and beans cannot be planted next to each other because the onions are allopathic, meaning that they have a, a toxin and they will actually stunt the beans and the beans won't grow. So this is a really great reference to, that you can go in at the back index lists out all these different vegetables and you can go and see 
what they recommend to grow with it, what they recommend to not grow with it. Um, you can obviously also Google everything you're planning online to see is there something that is going to be damaging. But this is a nice reference tool and you'll learn a lot from this book about that things that you just never would have thought about. Um, which brings me to our little note on, I mentioned the, the herbs down here. So we are going to grow dill with our cabbage and our kale because it actually helps to control cabbage worms which can be a huge problem in your garden. Um, we're growing nasturtium with all of our summer squashes because we have a huge problem with squash bugs and squash vine borers in, well, uh, probably everywhere, but certainly in this part of the country. And they can kill your squash before, I mean, they literally will come out one morning and the squash will be like lying there looking totally decimated. And it's because one of these squash vine borers has gotten up in the stem and has literally eaten through the stem and the plant disconnects from the ground. So, we have to watch for those bugs anyway, but putting things like nasturtiums around it can really help you with controlling that. Um, and there are other things like calendula, cilantro, that will definitely be beneficial in controlling certain pests in your garden. So again, the book I've referenced is very helpful in determining what you might wanna plant with something else. Um, all right, so that, oh, and well, actually speaking of onions not being good with beans, but they are very good with peppers. <laughs> <laughs> so peppers and onions are have a, a symbiotic relationship and they will actually support each other so it's it's interesting um, the more you garden the more you learn that's all I can say <laughs> and then you would like to eat these plants I think so that means you need to protect them <laughs> and honestly that becomes one of the biggest challenges so we have many things that would like to eat your vegetables before you do um, some of them are four-footed some of them are winged you know there's a variety so as you can see here, we have electric fence around this garden. Um, it's just two little lines of wire. We, we solar power all of our electric fences. Um, you, these, the, all of this equipment you can you know, look at at places like you know, Tractor Supply or Agway. I mean, your, big, your farm supply stores all carry this because they're used on farms everywhere. So we have the electric fence, which is really for Basically, it's for the deer, which in Vermont, I mean, let's be honest, they're pretty in intense and everywhere. They're in everyone's garden. And they can, pre they can pretty clear cut a garden pretty fast if you let them in. So, so the electric fence, which is, it's actually quite inexpensive to do, um, and you're not gonna have an electric bill because you're using solar. So we do recommend that if you, know, if you have deer in your yard, which you probably do. Um, the other thing that we recommend is, this is called insect netting, this white, sort of foam that you can probably see in the background. And that does two things. It does help prevent a number of insects from getting on your plants early in the year so they can get established, they can get big and healthy. And it also will keep out things like rabbits, which are a problem for us here at the Victory Garden. Um, we've had rabbits, we've had foxes, we fortunately have not had woodchucks. I, it, a woodchuck would not woodchuck would go right through this but it will keep out rabbits and that really makes a big difference because our experience has been that if the plant is small it's much more likely to be chomped down by one of these creatures once they get big and healthy we have much less of a problem and and reality is once these plants get bigger the insect cloth needs to come off because they have to get pollinated so right now we're actually keeping all the bees and, and pollinators out um, in an effort to keep out other things like squash bugs and you know, different aphids and other things that are going to attack the plants, especially when they're young and don't have a lot of strength. So, the obviously fencing. Um, mulching is another thing that we do to protect the plants. As we mentioned, it's under the tomato plants right now. That's to prevent any bacteria, fungal disease to splashing up on the leaves. But it is also going to help you keep the weeds down. And, and weeds are, you know, technically another pest. Weeds are going to take all the nutrient and the soil, the water, away from the plants. And they're going to be fighting your vegetables. So we, <laughs> it's putting mulch down makes your life a lot easier. I mean, you could be out here, you can weed all the time, you can leave the soil exposed, but it's a lot more work. The other thing that the mulches do is it actually protects your soil because wind and rain will actually start to reduce the nutrients in your soil. So if you've protected it with, as I said, we have straw, you can use leaf, um, we don't recommend wood chips on young plants only because wood chips actually are going to suck some of the nitrogen out of the soil to help them disintegrate and, and to start to turn into mulch. 
and that's again that's going to kind of pull from your plant so um, if your wood chips have kind of rotted and gotten nice and soft and mushy that's fine but fresh wood chips we would not use as a mulch around uh, young vegetable plants so if you use basically these techniques and the other one is just you <laughs> we actually check vegetables like cabbages and um, all the squashes during the season and to watch for these bugs because the squash vine borer, the squash bug, um, the Colorado potato beetle, the three stripe plant bug, there are a lot of beetles that attack, they don't just attack the cucumbers of the potatoes, they attack your tomatillos, they, they, like, they, they're hungry. Um, but they're a good size, so I mean you can see them, you know they're yellow and striped or they're, they're a good sized bug and we literally will go down the path with a bucket of soapy water and we just pull them off and we dump them in the water. Um, and you know, it, we just, we, we literally manually remove them. We're not, we're not into using chemicals. And so we have to basically, you know, fight fire with fire, which means our fingers are do a lot of, of the work in keeping these um, gardens protected. And which is another reason when you start, don't make your garden too big because it's, you know, you want to check your plants and you don't want to be spending hours doing that. Fortunately, with most of these bugs, they have sort of a moment when they bloom and they're all over everything and then they kind of calm down and, and the season gets a little calmer as we go through the summer. Um, but at that point, you may be dealing with different issues like not enough water, a drought, and you know, there's, trust me, there's always something to do with your garden. <laughs> and so we finally though, now we've gotten through all this, right? You've planted, you've protected, and now you have food. Um, and so, Harvesting is honestly the best part. It's why we do all of this. And as I said, things harvest at different times. Your lettuces, your peas, they're going to be early summer. They don't like a lot of heat. You can plant them again late in August and get a fall crop, um, but they're not going to be growing for you in July in the beginning of August. It's just too hot. Your squashes are going to start coming in midsummer and they're just going to keep coming. Your winter squash, you're probably not even harvesting until you get the first cold snap because they're still, you know, they're, they're still getting harder and happier. Um, as long as you don't have a problem with squash bugs or, or, or squash vine borers, you're, you could have zucchini pretty much, I don't know, starting mid-July all summer. I mean, it's, it really keeps reproducing. It's, it's, it's great. Beans, you can grow all summer. Um, the first round will be very, there'll be a lot of beans and then you'll, you'll, the plants will still be there. They'll, they'll stop producing you. So you could just take them out and put in another row. I mean, you can put in at least two crops of beans across during the summer, even in Vermont, um, cause they, they come out very, very quickly. And then all of your, your brassicas like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, they take longer to develop. Um, you'll get broccoli midsummer, and, and then it'll be over and finished. It'll, it'll start having little florets, which you can eat with those big heads. You will not have after midsummer. Um, we found Brussels sprouts are really a fall vegetable. I mean, by the time they've really filled out and are nice and big, it's like October. And you can actually leave them in the ground through several frosts. Um, it keeps them fresh. They, they will not go bad on you. And so then when you're ready to eat them, just pull the whole plant out, take the Brussels sprouts off. And that can, is literally, you can do that at Thanksgiving. You can do that very late. Um, the cabbages and cauliflower, you know, mid to late summer, um, they'll head up and then that's it. Obviously that's a, that's a one shot on that plant. You, you pick it and you've got it. And that's, you know, kind of how it works. <laughs> okay, now it's your turn. Time to plant and watch those veggies grow over the summer. Have fun and good luck. For the GNAT TV News Project, I'm Andrew McKeever.